Our scripture reading this morning is Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 28, and can be found in the, on page 985 in the Pew Bibles. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. Amen. Whether you noticed it or not, last Tuesday marked a tectonic moment in the United Methodist Church. It was the final day of a special general conference, and it was called, that had been called, to discuss and debate one topic, that of human sexuality. On Tuesday, the final vote was taken, and by a narrow majority, 53% of the delegates voted on a plan to retain, and in some ways, double down on the church's current prohibitive stance on homosexuality as it pertains to marriage and ordination. I might add, just so that we understand who is in those numbers, the United Methodist Church is a global church. Two-thirds of the North American delegates voted against this plan. Seventy percent of the delegates and also uh, and and also you know taking polls throughout the church 70% of those under 40 do not agree with this this is something that is going to continue to be debated and fought for a long time since then as a, and as expected the story was picked up by almost every major news outlet and there's a good chance that many, if not most of you, saw it. Now the headlines made it sound like this was a done deal. It is not. The plan that was voted in had already been deemed unconstitutional even before it went up for a vote. What that means is that it will now go before the United Methodist Church's Judicial Council where they will look at the constitutionality of it either in part or in whole. And there is a good chance that this whole thing might get voted out altogether. In other words, no one has any idea how this is going to play out. Only time will tell how this story is told. The sermon that I'm about to preach is not exactly the one that I had originally planned which I will explain later. It's close, but as the week wore on, the deep divide that we always suspected was in our church became more and more apparent. Some of you got my letter from last week. If I had an email address from you, I, I, you got it. And what I, you may have noticed that I said, and I pointed out that there are passionate hearts on both sides of this issue, both on the global stage and in our church. There are people that stand on every spot of the spectrum in this church as we speak. And we have to acknowledge that while there are some hearts that are relieved and are possibly rejoicing, many of our hearts are breaking in this moment. To make a huge understatement, this is complicated. So let us pray. God of glory, God of mercy, we turn our eyes upon you and seek your guidance. Speak to us now in such a way that we, that we receive what it is that you want us to hear, whether that is through the words of my mouth or the meditations of all of our hearts or somewhere in the space in between. Amen. Today I'm going to use a word a lot that may be new to some of you. It's the word liminal. L-I-M-I-N-A-L, 
liminal. It's an adjective, and it is usually used in, in, in realms of like anthropology and psychology. What it is, is it refers to times or modes of transition. <laughs> there was somebody after the first service that pointed out that it sounds a little like the Twilight Zone. And it kind of does, I have to admit. You'll see. It's a concept that was introduced in the early 20th century by ethnographer Arnold Van Gennep. And it was taken up by anthropologist Victor Turner shortly thereafter. The word liminal comes from the Latin root, root lemon, which means threshold. Liminality is the crossing over space, that liminal space. When you hear people refer to liminal space, it's that crossing over space, a space where you have left something behind, yet you are not fully into something else. It's transition. In practice, liminality is understood to be a stage in the rite of passage where there, you know, the, you see this, the, there be uh, uh, rituals of rites of passage in, in, in tribal groups or in, even in other cultures as, like that. And it's understood to be the transition, the rite of passage between childhood, well, for instance, an example, childhood to adolescence and adolescence to adulthood. And even though it may look different between each culture, it and, and each person, it is universally accepted as that disorienting feeling of having a foot in two different realities and not yet feeling that you are a part of either one. Some of you may or may not remember what it felt like to leave home for the first time. Remember how it was when we were packing up our childhoods so that we were ready to step out into the world, into adulthood, and all we felt was just very, very confused, felt like we had no idea what we were doing, and that we didn't belong anywhere. That's liminality. A less dramatic example of liminality comes from Ellen Seal. One kind of liminal space is that time in the early morning when you are floating in and out of sleep. Deep in the night, it seems that there are no boundaries between realities, time, space, and thoughts. Everything swirls together, entering the liminal space between the dark and the light. You may vacillate between the boundary, free dimension, and the world of form and structure. You aren't sure where you are and what is real and what is imagined. Then as daylight ushers you back into three-dimensional awareness, you re-enter the linear, somewhat orderly world of structure and form. That was what she thought sounded like the Twilight Zone. As you can tell, liminality can be, by its own nature and definition, somewhat mysterious. It's a specific concept and yet very difficult to grasp. And perhaps because of that, or perhaps because it is tied very tightly to ritual, it has also been embraced as a, so, uh, as a, as a spiritual and a theological concept. Author, Franciscan priest, and spiritual leader Richard Rohr has this to say about it. We keep praying that our illusions will fall away. God erodes them from, the many, si from many sides, hoping that they will fall away. But we often remain trapped in what we call normalcy, the way things are. To get out of this unending cycle, we have to allow ourselves to be drawn into sacred space, into liminality. All transformation takes place here. We have allowed ourselves to be drawn out of business as usual and remain patiently on the threshold where we are betwixt and between the familiar and the completely unknown. There alone is our old world left behind. Well, we are not sure of the, yet of the new existence. It is the realm where God can best get at us because our false certitudes are finally out of the way. This is the sacred space where the old world is able to fall apart and the bigger world is revealed. The threshold is God's waiting room. Here we are taught openness and patience as we come to expect an appointment with the divine doctor. If we have eyes to see, we will notice all of the ways and the, and the way that all of the liminal spaces in our Christian faith. It's full of it. Full 
of liminal spaces. As a matter of fact, some people, both inside and outside the Christian faith, um, they have written that the entire nature of Christianity itself is one big liminal space because we understand ourselves be, to be temporary residents of the world. And they consider that, a, well, that's got to be liminality. I don't agree with that. I think that it's a little bit of a stretch to consider an entire existence, even though we do believe that there is more life beyond this, to, to consider an entire life to be a liminal space. But, but, you can see that it is a little bit easier for Christians. This is one of the reasons why, as Christians, we are able a little easier to wrap our brain around the concept of liminality, that, 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 that not, that already and not yet, that mysterious space in between space has been built into our faith from the very beginning, from Jesus' teachings, Jesus, from te the teachings of Jesus himself. As Christians, we understand our experience to be one of journey, one of growth, not one of arrival. It is also something that is unique to our own expression of our Christian faith, which is Methodism, which we have inherited from hundreds of years of faithful believers, beginning with the founder of Methodism himself, John Wesley. And all throughout, all throughout, Methodists, all of us, have tried our hardest to work out our faith through the study and the discernment of Scripture through our best understanding of the history of the church and its traditions as we perceive them. Our own experiences with God through Christ with other people and with other people and our own efforts to reason our way to what we believe God is trying to tell us. Most people who study these kinds of things agree that Methodism's most significant contribution to the entirety of Christian thought and practice is Wesley's emphasis on what he called the via salutis, which is Latin for the way of salvation. Now, a lot of times people want to call this the plan of salvation, and that is a misinterpretation, a mistranslation. That implies arrival. That implies that there is that, that that this that there is some place where we can where we can land, and that we can just stay there. That is not the understanding of the via salutis. salutis. Salvation in this understanding is a path, a journey, a prolonged experience of what he called grace upon grace, or growing in grace. No matter who we are. We all believe that we have more to learn and further to go. To that end, we have also inherited the practice of the means of grace. And those of you that have been with me for a while, and you know that we've talked about that in the past, and that a means of grace, or the means of grace, are habits that we intentionally engage in to deepen our relationship with God and with others so that we can become more open to receiving God's truth and grace. Now, when I first planned this morning's worship, I intended it to be a deep dive. I was going to spend some time teaching on one of our, our most sacred liminal spaces, rituals, and also a means of grace, the sacrament of Holy Communion. This was my intention. I was going to teach through some of the parts of it, because you know how much I like to point out those things that I think we don't notice anymore because we do them so often? I like to point them out and say, we, we, you need to pay attention to this because it's there for a reason. And don't just think you know what it says. Don't they just think you, you, you know what it means. And I believe that from time to time it's important to take a good look at the things we do and why we do them. When we worship, when we come together to worship, it's not just going through the motions. I want you to know that there is a reason for the things we do. And quite frankly, if I don't have a reason for the things we do and I can't explain it, we probably need to stop doing it. But most of what we do, there is a deep theological reason. And I'd like you to know these things. And that includes in the Sacrament of Communion. The early Greeks used the word mysterion when naming the sacraments, of which in the United Methodist Church and the Methodist Church and a lot of Protestant churches, there's two. 
It's baptism and communion because we believe that those are the two that Jesus himself ordained and commanded of us. And that word mysterion usually translates to mystery. So it should come as no surprise that the sacrament of Holy Communion is known as the Holy Mystery. We believe that it is in these sacred moments, on this threshold between all that we think we know that there, all that we think we know, and all that there is available to us to receive. We believe that it is there that God discloses things to us that are beyond the human capacity to receive. Whenever we participate in communion together, we enter into a very sacred liminal space where we must let go of the things to which we hold most tightly so that we can grasp those things that give us eternal life and peace. We have to let go of so much so that we can be available to grab onto something else. But in our finite ability to understand the infinite nature of God, it is still important, even though this is a mystery, even though we are not capable of understanding every part of it, it is still important for us to understand that there are reasons behind what we do and why we do it. I also knew that we would be coming off of a hard week. And today we might feel a little more fractured than we have in a while. Communion is one of those moments in our faith communities where we have the opportunity to come forth and rededicate our lives to Christ. It is truly an altar call. It is the moment that when we do come forward, we have the opportunity, if we choose to take it, to rededicate our lives to Christ or to dedicate our lives to Christ. But we also believe that it's a time that we can celebrate the fact that we are all united, that we are all one. In that holy mystery that we come forward and participate in together, we celebrate that we are the body of Christ. Perhaps it is fortuitous that in a time such as this, today was already scheduled to be Communion Sunday. Either way, well, I don't know. It might have been a co coincidence, but either way, my hope was that we might be able to find an island of peace and unity in what has become a pretty stormy sea of division and hurt. But as I watched and listened to all of the fallout from General Conference earlier this week, it became clear to me that this is not just a, a moment in our church. This is a liminal moment in our church. We are experiencing a transition, and honestly, it's anyone's guess as to what will emerge once the dust settles. But we are transitioning from what it was that was to what it is the United Methodist Church will become. And we will look different. We will not be the same. But moments like these are truly nothing to followers of Christ. Ours is a faith built on the promise and the hope of transformation, even when it comes with pain. And let's be honest, most transformation and transition comes with pain. It's really hard to avoid it. So in a few moments, we're going to do that deep dive into the Holy Sacrament, of the, that sacred liminal experience of Holy Communion. And like I had planned, I am going to pause from time to time throughout the entire ritual, and I'm going to teach as to what we, why we are doing what we are doing. Those words that I will use will be the same ones that I had originally intended to use. However, in light of where we are, in light of the things that have just happened, in light of this liminal space that our church currently sits in. I invite you to enter into this experience of the sacrament 
with an open heart to the threshold that it truly is. It is the liminal space that we get to step into between heaven and earth, between already and not yet, and between who we are and who God wants us to be. Be present. And don't try to grasp what's going on with your finite capacity. Let the infinite holy mystery wash over you. And perhaps on that sacred threshold, we can let loose of the things that we grip so tightly that our knuckles hurt so that we can grasp that promise and hope of transformation even when it comes with some pain. As we enter into this time of communion, I will offer explanations along the way. Now, bear in mind, we don't do anything radically different here in the Methodist Church than other traditions do. We do some things different, but many of the things that we do are very familiar from, from denomination to denomination, from faith to faith. And so some of these things will, will be either Methodist-specific or they will just be in general. First of all, what we do here goes by many different names. We've heard it be the Lord's Supper. We've heard it called Holy Communion. We've heard it called Eucharist. And each of those names is both right and incomplete. Because calling it the Lord's Supper reminds us that Jesus both invites and hosts us at the table. Calling it Holy Communion reminds us that this is an act of the most intimate and holy sharing making us one with Jesus Christ and part of his body, the church. Calling it the Eucharist is borrowing a term taken from the New Testament Greek, meaning thanksgiving. And so as you can see, our, our finite human language is still not enough to contain this holy mystery. All are welcome to participate. Methodists are but Methodists practice open communion because we believe that this is Christ's table and no one else's. And his gift of love and grace is available to everyone and anyone who wishes to receive it. It is his invitation and not ours. Methodist pastors are even forbidden we take a vow, it is a part of our vows. We are forbidden to refuse communion to anyone because we believe that there is no one, including a Methodist pastor, who can be the determiner of who is worthy and who isn't. 2,000 years ago, Jesus ate with all kinds of sinners, including Methodist pastors. He still does. We believe that we are all sinners standing in the need of God's grace. If we all waited until we felt worthy or until we were worthy, Jesus would eat alone. Amen. All are welcome at the table. Every single person who wants to receive Christ's gift of grace is welcome here. We believe that it, the moment that is, we believe that the moment that someone receives the bread and the cup, we believe that moment is so full of the possibility of transformation that everyone should be able to experience it. In the earliest days of Methodism, John Wesley, he went out into the streets, he went out into the fields, and he offered communion to everyone who wanted it, and even some people who didn't. He was sometimes accused of force feeding people. But that's how much he believed in the power of the Holy Spirit that is in the moment that we receive the bread and the cup. And yes, this is not the case in every denomination, but in the United Methodist Church, in Methodism, our welcome extends to children too, if their parents are okay with it. We remember that when some of Jesus' disciples tried to keep the children away from him, he said, let the children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. We realize that they may not fully understand what's going on. Honestly, who among us does? This is the holy mystery. 
What you will see me do with a young child, though, sometimes, I usually use the words, the body of Christ given for you, the cup of salvation poured out for you. Oftentimes what I will do with a very young child is I will get down on their level and I will say, always remember that Jesus loves you. Because that's what is happening in that moment. Children do, however, have a beautiful sense of wonder and mystery. And as such, we could probably learn a lot from them. And so Jesus knew this. And he said to the adults in the room, Jesus said, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. It is also because of our commitment to an open communion that we use grape juice instead of wine. Serving wine would exclude too many people. That includes people that struggle with alcohol. It also includes children. We believe that as long as we partake of the fruit of the vine and the wheat of the field, we are being faithful. And while we're on that topic, no, we don't have to believe or pretend that this is actually the body and the blood of Christ. We believe that when we, when we say the words of blessing over the, 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 the elements, we believe that the transformation, the transition is spiritual. Having said that, blessed elements are blessed. And so we believe that any time we need to dispose of the elements after communion has taken place, they must either be consumed or put on bare ground, not concrete, but put outside on bare ground where they will then go back to the earth. Also, it is a, it's, it's something you may see us do, pastors and assistants. We will, what we do is we recover the bread and the cup after communion has happened. That is a sign of reverence over the body that we believe, the, the body and the blood that we believe has, has spiritually transformed, it has spiritually transformed into. We also believe that while anyone can participate in or assist in communion, only an ordained elder like myself, or if you know uh, Pastor Larry or Pastor Billy, we are all ordained elders. We believe that there are those who are set apart and ordained for some of the special tasks in the church, and that includes invoking the Holy Spirit on the elements of baptism and <laughs> the waters of baptism, the elements of communion. That is why you will see that it's a very short moment. It's a very specific moment, and I will point it out to you later on. It's towards the end of the ritual. And at this time, Chris, would you, those that would, are assisting in communion, come on down. We are entering into what is known as the Great Thanksgiving, as you can see. This is what we call this, this, this prayer that we offer up. It really is mostly in prayer form. It begins with a dialogue. It is one that, that allows us to greet each other as fellow travelers on this journey of faith. And it also gives us an opportunity to unite together in inviting the Lord to enter into this space with us. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. And now in the next part, we speak directly to God. We remember God's acts of salvation throughout history, God's covenant with humanity, multiple covenants with humanity, and especially the work of God's creation and, lo and steadfast love, even when humanity was disobedient and unfaithful. It is a right and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, you formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. And when we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity and made covenant to be our sovereign God and spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one. Of the Lord. 
Next, we turn our attention to the specific work and ministry of Jesus himself, including the remembrance of his offering to us, which we are celebrating in the ritual itself. It also reminds us of our own commitment to mission in the world. Listen to the words in the way that they reflect both. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recover sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and he blessed it and he said, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. Likewise, when supper was over, Jesus took the cup and he blessed it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. And now we bless the elements when we invite the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon the bread and the cup, as well as everyone else who will gather at the table. It ends with a fervent prayer for peace and for unity and common mission among all of those who follow Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these and on these gifts make them be for us the body and blood of christ that we may be for the world the body of christ redeemed by his blood by your spirit make us one with christ one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your son jesus christ with the holy spirit in your holy church all honor and glory is yours almighty god now and forever amen and now with the confidence that we all can claim as those that are all called children of God, let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day the food we need. Forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us all. And lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
and as we move through to the end of this sacred liminal space that we have been together, this ritual of Holy Communion, we end with a prayer of thanksgiving, understanding that the true gift of love and grace that we have all been given, being thankful for it, even though not a single one of us has earned it. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <laughs>